Uh, professor Saad Joseph is distinguished research professor of anthropology and gender sex, uh, uh, anthropology and gender sexuality and women's studies. Her research has focused on her native Lebanon, on the politicization of religion, on local communities, on women, family, and state, and on questions of self, citizenship, and rights. Her current research is a long-term, longitudinal study on how children in a village of Lebanon learn their notions of rights, responsibilities, and citizenship in the aftermath of the civil war and on their transnational families who have moved to the United States and Canada. She is founder of the uh, Middle East Research Group in Anthropology. Um, the name changed to Middle East section of the American Anthropological Association. She is founder and founding ed director of the Middle East South Asia Studies Program at UC Davis. She is founder and director of the Arab Families Working Group and founder of the Association for Middle East Women's Studies and co-founder of um, Journal of Middle East Women's Studies. This is at this point 40% of the bio, uh, the, the brief bio, uh, just to give you a map. She's also founder and director of the University of California Davis Arab Region Consortium, which includes American University of Beirut, American University in Cairo, the Lebanese American University, the University of California in Birzeit, and American University of Sharjah. She is currently directing three new projects for UCDAR, which I mentioned, uh, mapping the production of knowledge on women and gender in the Arab region, transforming refugee um, mental health, gendering STEM education, uh, she served as the president of the Middle East Studies Association of North America, MESA, uh, in 2010 and 2011. She is founding and general editor of the Encyclopedia of Women and Islamic Cultures. Her edited books include Arab Family Studies, Critical Reviews, Women and Islamic Cultures, Disciplinary Paradigms and Approaches, Gender and Citizenship in the Middle East, and Intimate Selving in Arab Families. Her co-edited books include co-edited books include Arab American Women Representation and Resistance, Building Citizenship in Lebanon, and Women and Power in the Middle East, and Muslim Christian Conflicts, Economic, Political, and Social Origins. She has published over 100 articles and won many awards and prizes, including the UC Davis Undergraduate Teaching and Research Award, and the Middle East Studies Association's Jerry uh, Bacharak Service Award, and the UC Davis. Edward A. Dickinson Emeriti, uh, Emeriti Professorship. And I will stop here. There is a longer bio, uh, which uh, we could actually uh, publish when we publish this uh, talk. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, outstanding in terms of the uh, production of knowledge. But more importantly, as somebody who has known uh, Saad for, uh, I could say decades, since I you know, was in my undergraduate and graduate years uh, in the 90s. And I must say that um, in addition to all of this, uh, Saad is a, a truly exceptional human being. And in, in, in a short word, because there is really no time to, to, to say enough at this point, uh, I, I am honored uh, to present and introduce somebody who has been a spectacular, empowering figure in the field, not least for young women. Um, and she has uh, put her mark on so much of the scholarship and knowledge production in Middle East studies in ways that are very difficult to replicate. I am honored and extremely excited to uh, present uh, to everyone, uh, Dr. Suad Joseph. Thank you for that lovely, lovely um, introduction. Um, and I want to thank George Mason University and the Arab Studies Institute, but especially my good friend Bassam Haddad for this invitation. It's an honor to be with you and to invite you into a little journey with me today. It will be a little journey, but I cannot resist. Thank you for all of you who put your camera on. I've given a talk to a blank screen and I've given a talk to just seeing my own face and that's not good chemistry. <laughs> so thank you for being willing to put your cameras on and I cannot resist a shout out to my beloved friend, Hanan Sabai and to Hatun al Fasi, who we all know. Uh, Maya McDissey, thank you for joining us. Zach Lockman, 
um, Pauline, Vincent, Humsey, uh, I, I just, I mean, it just warms my heart to see all of your faces on the screen. So I can't go through all of them because there's several pages, but I just want to, at least the first page, uh, give you a shout out because it means a lot to me that you've joined us today. An earlier version of this talk was presented in 2017 at the Middle East section of the American Anthropological Association. The paper offers a somewhat personalized genealogy of institutional development in Middle East studies based largely on my years doing Middle East studies and building institutions in Middle East studies. It's not entirely chronological, but it tries to be. It's not an intellectual history. It's not paradigmatic, nor is it a political history of Middle East studies. For those intellectual, paradigmatic, or political histories, I really encourage you to read Edward Said's Orientalism, Zach Lockman's wonderful field notes, or Timothy Mitchell's The Middle East and the Past and Future of Social Science. Recently, Ethnologie Francaise asked me to write a reflection on my article uh, on my research in Lebanon. About the same time, editors of an international collection on sibling relations asked me to do a reflection on my 1994 sibling uh, uh, brother-sister article, which for some reason is the most cited article that I've written. This past spring, the uh, Ines conference in Sicily asked me to do a reflection on Recently, Ethnologie Francaise asked me to write a reflection okay. on my article, uh, on my research in Lebanon. Okay, there's a feedback. The All right. And editor collection of uh, sibling relations. The sound has been recording on my 1994. Uh, MK, if you can Hi. mute whoever has their. Yep, working on it right now. Working on it right Thank now. Thank you. We should be good to go. Thank you so much. Okay. Sorry, let me start that again. So recently, Ethnologie Francaise asked me to write a reflection article on my research in Lebanon. And about the same time, editors of an international journal asked me to write a reflection piece on my uh, sorry, the International Collection on Sibling Relations asked me to do a reflection chapter on my 1994 brother-sister article. And this past spring, the Innes Conference in Sicily asked me to give a reflection lecture on my work on selving. Several organizations I founded or co-founded have asked me to write organizational histories of those, uh, of those specific organizations. So you know you're getting old. When you get asked to write reflection pieces on your own work, and you're asked to write histories on your activities, but I'm a little stubborn. So I refuse to feel old, and I use this occasion to reflect on a half century of institutional building for Middle East studies, especially in anthropology and in gender, uh, women and gender and feminist studies for the Middle East. In so many ways, this is an auspicious time for a reflection on Middle East studies. The United States is more polarized than at any time since perhaps the Civil War years ago. The world is perhaps more polarized than it has been since the World War II Cold War. The FBI reported that uh, 2019 witnessed the highest number of hate crimes in the United States in over a decade with 7,314 criminal cases attributed to race, gender or ethnic bias according to a New York Times article just two days ago. The New York Times reporter suggested that because of the way the FBI records criminal activity, that this figure of 7,314 hate crimes is probably underreporting. Islamophobia is at an all-time high. Deployment of Islam as a political kickball escalated after the last presidential cycle began in 2015. The Muslim ban of 2017 denied visas and travel to the United States for people from seven Muslim-majority countries, Iran, Iraq, Libya, Syria, Somalia, Sudan, and Yemen. And in June 2018, the Supreme Court upheld that Muslim ban in a 5-4 ruling. The Department of Education has witnessed cuts in funding for Centers for Middle East Studies across the country. The National Humanities Alliance reported in 2018 that cuts starting in 2011 under a Republican Congress resulted in 25% fewer national resource centers and 18% fewer undergraduate graduate fellowships for all area studies, Title VI centers. Middle East Title VI centers have been, has, have been subject, subjected to increasing surveillance of their activities, creating more constraints on academic freedom for scholars of the region. We saw a recent example of that in the 2019 August inquiry into the Duke University, University of California, uh, University of Chap uh, North Carolina Chapel Hill Consortium, 
by the Department of Education. DOE chastised the consortium, asking them to present a more balanced view of the Middle East, always a code word for uh, words to curtail academic freedom. It is an auspicious time for a reflection. Surveillance of Middle East American acti activists has uh, accelerated. Scrutiny of job hirings and tenure proceedings of Middle East scholars has increased. Censorship of scholarly activities around Middle East issues has hit social media. We saw a recent example of social media censorship just a few weeks ago when Zoom shut down the webinar organized by San Francisco State University professors Rabab Abdel Hadi and Tomami Kinukawa. The webinar fe featured Palestinian resistance figure Laila Khalid. Academic freedom for scholars of Middle East continues to be challenged as they fight against the equation of anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. We just saw this conflation in the statement by President Carol Folt of the University of Southern California in August of 2020. This morning, Michael Papeo, the first American Secretary of State to visit an Israeli settlement, which our government and the international community have long considered to be illegal, made a statement there just yesterday. The statement that the State Department will now regard the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement, BDS, which calls for boycott of goods made in Israeli settlements as anti-Semitic and will punish those who support it. That was this morning. This conflation also is seen in various attempts to legitimate an equation of anti-Zionism and the criticism of the state of Israel with anti-Semitism in legislative efforts. So research in the, and research in the Middle East region itself has become more perilous as dictatorships, military regimes, and reactionary political elites consolidate power in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. The author authoritarian re regional regimes impose many forms of censorship and surveillance on scholars and the media. So in an increasingly polarized America and an increasingly polarized world, Islam and the Middle East are historically charged trigger points for polarizations. It is indeed an auspicious time for refle reflection on Middle East studies. I call this talk, Cooking in the Cauldron, Middle East Studies 1966 to 2020. The past half century of the Middle East has been inflamed by wars, dislocation, upheavals, whose fires have been fed locally, regionally, and globally. The 1967 war, the 1973 war, the 1975-1995 Lebanese civil war, the 1980 to 1988 Iran-Iraq war, the 1982 invasion leading to 20 years of occupation of Lebanon by Israel, the Sudanese civil war, 1983 to 2005, the first Palestinian intifada, 1987 to 1991, the 1990-91 first Gulf War, the Algerian civil war, 1991 to 2002, the second Palestinian intifada, 2000, the September 11th, 2001 attacks, the 2001 war on Afghanistan, the 2003 war on Iraq, the 2006 Israeli-Lebanon war, the 2010-11 Arab Spring, the 2011 fall of dictators in Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, the launching of the ongoing wars in Syria and Yemen, the consolidation of power by dictators in Egypt and Syria, the 2019 uprisings in Lebanon, and indeed the paralysis of government in Lebanon, Iraq, uh, Libya, Yemen, and Syria. The people that have been do do uh, dislocated in these past decades are in the millions. 40% of the world's refugees today are from the Middle East with Syria being the leader. The lives lost are in the millions. The lives destroyed, the homes demolished, the generations of children and youth broken and families torn apart, the economies ravished, the democracies failed or floundering and political stability, a distant, a distant <coughs> uh, and um, Sorry about that, I just, I unplugged the phones. <laughs> uh, we, we came of age, the, the fires of the cauldron have been cooking in open spaces for half a century in the Middle East. We came of age as the Middle East in the time of raging fires. It is an auspicious time for reflection. I start this somewhat personalized institutional genealogy of Middle East studies with the period of the 1960s. The period of the 1960s brought forward the free speech movement, the global anti-war anti protest, the civil rights movement, 
the second wave of the women's movement, the cauldron was boiling over, spilling inflamed issues all over the world. For those of us who started graduate study in this period of global turmoil, there were few safe places, few institutional locations for Middle East studies. I began graduate school in 1966. I spent one year at the University of Pittsburgh and transferred to Columbia University in 1967 in, in anthropology. Neither university had a Middle East anthropologist, nor did they offer courses in Middle East anthropology at the time. So much had not yet been created or named or institutionalized in Middle East studies. Following World War II and, and the overwhelming destruction of Europe, the United States emerged as a world power. The Cold War intensified and the USSR launched Sputnik in 1957. And then there was an awareness in Congress that the United States was behind in understanding the world and had to invest more in education in all disciplines. For the sake of national security, Congress felt that America needed to learn the languages of the world. In 1958, for example, only 23 students in all of the United States were studying Hindi. So in 1958, Congress passed the National Defense Education Act, NDEA, authorizing the funding of the National Resource Centers, which came to be known as the Title VI Centers, to study foreign languages. Along with them came the National Defense Foreign Language Fellowships and later the Fulbright and the Fulbright Hayes programs. My first year at Columbia University was funded by the National Defense Fellowship. We were learning languages for the defense of the nation. Columbia University and Harvard University both established Centers for Middle East Studies in 1954, UCLA in 1957 and Berkeley in 1963. But the Middle East Institute at Columbia in the 1960s was overwhelmingly political science and international affairs oriented, with some affiliated faculty being former ambassadors. In 1966, as I started graduate training, there was very little institutional presence for Middle East studies nationally. It was that year, 1966, that the Middle East Studies Association was founded. And in 1967, the Association for Arab American University graduates was founded a response to the 1967 Arab-Israeli War. Those of us in graduate programs in the 60s and 70s saw many things crumbling around us. At Columbia University in anthropology, where I was a graduate student in the 60s and 70s, we tore away at the foundational assumptions of functionalism, structuralism, and the 19th century social evolutionary theory that positioned the West at the top of a pyramid of progress. The, the challenge to institutional anthropology that that began in the 1960s and 70s was destined to be never ending. We did not have names for what we were doing, or at least not the names that they were later to be called by. We called it all revolution. Edward Said, who was at Columbia University at the same time I was, gave the critical name of Orientalism in 1978, a decade after the clay foundations of our, of our academic house was exposed. As graduate students in anthropology, we knew the intellectual architecture we were inheriting in the 1960s and 1970s was a shining city on a hill built on the colonial cudgels of capitalism, of imperialism, of slavery, of structural racism, of classism, of sexism, of extortion and extraction on the backs of people in color who are called the objects of study. We were reading dependency theory with Andre Gunder Frank world systems theories with Emmanuel Wallerstein, capitalist accumulation, neo-colonialism, and Eurocentrism with Samir Amin, and Marx on everything. The monthly review press was our sacred site for knowledge production. We were working with the thinkers of the times to decolonize knowledge and knowledge production. We knew that our intellectual paradigms and anthropology embedded assumptions of primitive societies evolving to become more civilized as they became more Western and white. We understood that anthropology had emerged as a colonial practice of governance, knowledge production for the sake of empire. We did not have answers, but we figured out a whole lot of what was wrong. We did not have institutional presence and we railed against the institutions anyway. We learned then to create our own institutions. And that is the story I wanna tell, the story of why it is important to build your own institutions and how ours came about. We read together, we ran our own seminars, which faculty attended. 
Many of us were involved in the, in the 1968 student strikes and some of us participated in the Students for Democratic Society focusing on the Labor Committee of SDS. By the late 1960s and early 1970s, a handful of us from Columbia Anthropology went off to do research in Middle Eastern countries. We returned by the early 1970s and found the world had changed again. The 1973 war between the Palestinians and the Lebanese already put an end to my two and a half years of field work. I returned to New York in 1973 to find my Columbia University and New York University colleagues in a state of disarray. The Labor Committee of the, SD, of the Students for Democratic Society, which some of us from Columbia Anthropology and NYU had joined, had gone mad. The Labor Committee had become a cult under the tyrannical and charismatic leadership of Lyndon LaRouche. It harassed and beat up members who did not toe the line in what came to be called Operation Mop Up. A group of us extracted members and went into temporary hiding in the face of the violence that came to be called the National Caucus of Labor Committees. I came back from field work in Lebanon to find the anthropology department at Columbia soon to be going into re receivership. The student press protests of 1968 had so torn the department that it was not allowed to govern itself. Many of my colleagues, especially the most progressive and radical of us, could not find jobs. They hung around the department, not completing their PhDs because there was nothing for them with a PhD. Institutional anthropology was slow to acknowledge or account for the student protests, the free speech movement, the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, and the women's movement. In the 1970s, we started reading groups, again, Middle East studies reading groups, Marxist reading groups, Middle East Marxist reading groups, feminist reading groups, Marxist feminist reading groups, Marxist urban anthropology reading groups. Urban anthropology was a brand new field at that time. I believe I was the first student to do doctoral exams in urban anthropology at Columbia. There were no seminars in urban anthropology and no seminars on Middle East anthropology. We were cooking in the cauldron inventing fields, building networks and organizations, learning to think about institutions and to think about institutionalizing our thinking. It, is, it was out of this boiling cauldron that the Middle East section of the American Anthropological Association was born. A number of us Marxist oriented anthropology graduate students from Columbia and New York University had done research in the Middle East. I invited them as well as a couple of others into a Middle East Marxist reading group from 1974 to 1976. We met regularly at my 100th Street and Central Park West apartment at that time on the borderline of Harlem. We did a close reading of Carl Wittbogel's Oriental Despotism and felt that it deserved to be revisited by anthropologists. In 1975, we decided to do a panel on Oriental Despotism at the 1976 American Anthropological Association meeting that was a meeting in Washington, DC that year. Someone in the reading group learned that Carl Wittfogel was living a few blocks away from me. He had testified in the MacArthur Congressional hearings in the 1950s and had been persona non grata in the AAA since that time. But we, unfettered by the history of the 1950s and still moved by the power of protest, the, greet, the greeting group agreed that we should try to contact him and ask him if he would be willing to be a discussant on our panel reviewing his, his work. Someone in the group suggested that Rob Dillon, Robert Dillon, my fellow Colombian anthropologist and not the musician, and I should go visit Carl Wittfogel. In those days, phone numbers were still listed publicly. I found his phone number and called him. He agreed to let us visit. Bob and I, but I must say mostly Bob because I was absolutely terrified in the presence of Wittfogel, explained our project and the panel to the AAA. To our surprise, he agreed to be a discussant. I asked Robert Murphy, my advisor at Columbia, to join us as the second discussant. But even more to our surprise, the panel was rejected by the American Anthropological Association. And in a, in a fit of peeve, I called Anthony Wallace, University of Pennsylvania, and the program chair to ask why it was rejected. He was flustered and apologetic, and I can't remember that he actually gave an explanation as to why it was rejected, but he gave me an interesting suggestion. He suggested instead that we create an organization and affiliate it with the AAA. Affiliated organizations, he explained, could hold organizational meetings at the AAA. And he suggested that our organizational meeting could be the panel with Wittfogel. 
So I made up the name, Middle East, Middle East Research Group in Anthropology, became its first president in order to offer the panel in 1976 in Washington, DC. However, when Vidfoka learned that only the name of Mirka would be on the AAA program and the name of the speakers would not appear, he refused to join the panel. Robert Murphy did join that panel. We held the panel to standing room only audience and Merga was born. The following year, the American Anthropological Association organized a plenary session with Carl Wittfogel as the honorary speaker and a lineup of senior scholars as discussants of his work. I learned two things from this experience. First, that the AAA would not allow a group of graduate students to bring back such a distinguished figure as Carl Wittfogel into the AA fold. We were co-opted by institutional anthropology. It was not because we were Middle East scholars or that some of us were Arab and some of us were Jews or that some of us were white and some of us were colored. It was because we were graduate students. I saw institutional anthropology's hierarchy. Second, I learned that even as graduate students, we could create our own organizations. We had, after all, still held the panel at the AAA. The room was packed, standing room only. I learned that there were things you could do as an organization that you could not do as a network or a group of friends or a revolutionary underground. That was my first lesson in institutional development, that institutions mattered for the production of knowledge, that institutions mattered for the visibility of knowledge. The institutions opened doors, created opportunities, and created a sustainable structural force beyond the persons who, who, create, who invented them. I learned that knowledge production produced by institutions endures. I founded America in 1976, only 10 years after the Middle East Studies Association was founded. America changed its name to the Middle East section of the American Anthropological Association when the AAA asked all affiliated organizations to become sections, the term they used, of the AAA. So from that roiling cauldron of Marxist anthropology, Middle East anthropology, Middle East Marxist studies, feminist studies, Marxist feminist studies, and urban anthropology studies, many of us forged intellectual movements, new courses, and institutions, all of which were intimately engaged with regional and global events and transformations. For example, the 1973 Arab-Israeli War shattered us again. The 1975 civil war in Lebanon broke out, a war in, uh, just as I was completing my dissertation. It was a war I had presaged in my dissertation, and it was raging by the time I defended my dissertation in the spring of 1975. By 1979, the Islamic Revolution in Iran took hold. The Iranian Revolution relaunched a privileging of the study of Islam in Middle East studies that continues unabated, although be, albeit transformed until this day. I had begun a collaborative research project in Iraq in 1980, but that year, 1980, the Iran-Iraq war put an end to my fieldwork in Iraq. By 1982, Israel had invaded Lebanon, lit the lights for a massacre in the Sabran Shatila Palestinian camp, camps in Beirut and embedded themselves in Southern Lebanon and fostered the Israeli trained and funded Southern Lebanese army for two decades. The Middle East, Studies Associ Middle East Studies in America became brutally divisive and violence, as violence raged in the countries that we came from or in which we did our research. When I came to the University of California in Davis in 1976, I was the only faculty who taught courses on the Middle East as a regular part of my teaching road. Soon after I arrived in UC Davis, I was asked to give a public lecture on the events in Lebanon. As an example of the rage that Middle East Studies promoted at that time. At the lecture, I had to take back the, the microphone during the Q&A to sh shout down a flaming shouting match between pro and Israeli Palestinian supporters in the audience. Similarly, at an open mic at the Mesa meetings just after Israel's invasion of Lebanon, I pleaded for scholarly sanity as scholars angrily attacked each other personally and politically, firing up the flames of intellectual partisanship. I felt I could no longer be a sane scholar and study the Middle East. I had spent years on the road and in the public media talking about Lebanon and the Middle East, trying to explain violence, arguing against religious explanations of Lebanon's civil war, trying to put events in historical context. 
I found myself with scholars much more distinguished than myself on blacklists, harassed by some students and occasionally a student's parent. Teaching Middle East study courses became a minefield. I was beginning to think that I had to leave the field of Middle East studies if I wanted to remain a scholar and sanely so. In 1980, I was among a group of scholars who co-founded the Women's Studies Program at UC Davis, which is a marvelous program of good colleagues and good collegiality with a shared vision and mission. While I had not been a feminist or a gender scholar, I did my doctoral research in the 1970s, the field experience and the data I gathered turned me into a scholar of gender. So I began to think that founding an organization for women's studies within the Middle East studies might bring sanity to scholarship, or at least for me. As it happened in 1984, the Middle East Studies Association asked me to co-chair the program committee for the annual MESA meeting that was to be held in San Francisco. I asked the program committee to allow me to organize the first plenary on women's studies at MESA. They agreed. I came to learn after I organized the plenary that the 1983 MESA meeting that was held in Chicago and which I missed had featured belly dancers as entertainment. A number of feminist MESA members walked out in protest and demanded that Mesa address gender issues. When she learned about the Women's Studies Plenary that, that was being planned for the 1984 uh, Mesa meeting, Elizabeth Fernia, one of those protesters, called me and asked me and told me about the Chicago meeting. I invited her to join the plenary. And to support the effort to bring Women's Studies to Mesa at that 1984 meeting in San Francisco, I helped to organize 10 panels on Women's Studies, the most Mesa had ever had at an annual meeting. And learning from my experience in founding MERGA, I worked with MESA to create a slot in the program to hold a special meeting to found an organization for Middle East Women's Studies. I invited Denise Candioti to be the keynote speaker at this special organizational meeting. That year, the same year, 1984, a number of us put a resolution uh, on the floor at the main MESA business meeting to condemn the blacklists of Middle East scholars that were circulating in academic circles. I, with many of my good colleagues, was on that blacklist. Mesa passed the resolution condemning uh, the black passed the resolution pack, uh, condemning the blacklist, but the meeting was a boiling cauldron. The resolution passed. The women's studies panels were packed. The special meeting with Denise Candioti was standing room only. But we failed to found the Association for Middle East Women's Studies that year. I tried the next year, asking colleagues to organize another ten panels, and again organizing a meeting this time with Laila Ahmed as the keynote speaker. In 1985, in the New Orleans uh, Mesa meeting, the Association for Middle East Women's Studies was founded. AMUSE was modeled on MERGA and the Middle East section of the American Anthropological Association. And AMUSE, like MES, continues today. In, two, in 2005, Miriam Cook, Sandra Hale, and I co-founded its journal, the Journal of Middle East Women's Studies. I founded AMUSE to get away from the roiling cauldron of Middle East studies. Amuse was and is marvelous. However, it was naive of me to think that women's studies would be free of the politics of the academy and of the world. By the late 1980s and early 1990s, the fires flaming women's studies in general and Middle East studies in particular began to burn within Amuse. Cooking up organizations and publications in Middle East studies became a major undertaking in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. The Society for Iranian Studies, later to be called the Association for Iranian Studies, was founded in 1967. MESA's International Journal of Middle East Studies, Ismis, was founded in 1970. The Ottoman Turkish Studies Association was founded in 1971. MEREP, Middle, uh, Middle East Reports, was founded in 1971 as well. The British Middle East Studies Association, BRISMIS, was founded in 1973, and its Journal of Middle East Studies in 1974. MEREP, the Middle East Research Group in a, in a Middle East Research uh, uh, Information Project, was founded in 1976. The Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee, ABC, was founded in 1980. The Feminist Arab American Network, FAN, was founded in 1982. The Arab American Institute, AAI, in 1985 and the Association of Middle East Women's Studies that we've talked about and used in 1986. The Syrian Studies Association was founded in 1993, the Arab Studies Journal in 1992, the Lebanese Studies Association in 1998, 
but it closed shop in 2002 and was refounded in 2018. Those decades were a period of institution building. Many of us have come to understand that knowledge protect, unprotected by institutions can have a short life or fail or be erased. To survive intellectually, to nurture those who would come after us, and to have an impact outside of ourselves with the knowledge that we produced, we had to build spaces within institutional structures to work and to live. While I saw the Association for Middle East Women's Studies and the Middle East section of the American Anthropological Association were struggling with the larger issues of Middle East studies, I still deeply believed in institution building. In 1998, I launched the, the Encyclopedia for Women in Islamic Studies with Brill. It was the first such project, a collaborative undertaking. Brill Eaglick has published 1,500 articles by 1,200 authors from all over the world, 4 million words covering 452 topics. And Eaglick's now publishing its second print edition, nine volumes, 2020 and 2021, and EWIC Online is launching the next generation in 2022. And we're launching an archival project by carrying out and hosting video interviews with foundational figures in the field of women and Islamic studies. So some of you plan to be called upon by us for those interviews. Institution building had become more specialized by the turn of the, of the current century. While in Cairo, Egypt, as the University of California Education Abroad Director at the American University in Cairo in 1999 to 2001, I became concerned to build regional organizations or organizations linking regional scholars with scholars outside the region. The project of decolonizing knowledge and knowledge production could not endure unless it was inclusive and in collaboration with regional scholars working with knowledge of local histories, cultures, and politics. In 2001, I founded the Arab Families Working Group a group of 16 scholars, mostly based in Egypt, Lebanon, Palestine, focusing on collaborative research on Arab families and, and youth. By 2008, AFWG started focusing on training the next generation of scholars to carry out rigorous critical social science research and continued that until 2018. This led me in 2016 to found the Transformative Engaged Research Group, TERG, T-E-R-G in 2016, focused entirely on training early career scholars in the Arab region to carry out research in their own countries and build theories that are historically, socially, and culturally contextualized for the region. TURG was built collaboratively by the collaborative commitments of my former students, Zaina Zatari, Lina Niari, and Nadine Neber. While I was in Cairo in 2001, I founded also uh, a consortium that was later called the University of California Davis Arab Region Consortium, UCDAR. UCDAR includes the American University of Beirut, the American University in Cairo, the Lebanese American University, Birzeit University, American University of Sharjah, in consortium with UC Davis. The goal of UCDAR is to carry out collaborative interdisciplinary region projects across the region and in part across the disciplines and across the region in partnership with each other and with UC Davis. Currently, three projects are active in UCDAR. Transforming Refugee Mental Health, which started in 2017, Gender and STEM Education, which also started in 2017, and Mapping the Production of Knowledge on Women and Gender in the Arab World, which started in 2015. And some of you on the screen are involved with some of these projects. All of them are collaborative, all of them are interdisciplinary, and all have scholars from five or six of the partner universities. At the time I was founding AFWG and UCDAR, a critical organization was being founded in Europe. The World Congress for Middle East Studies, WALKMAS, uh, organized its first conference in Mainz, Germany in 2002. WALKMAS continues holding conferences every four years, attracting many scholars from the region who are not able to attend Mesa's annual conference in North America. I returned to Davis in 2001 from Cairo to, to find the world changed again. The September 11, 2001 attacks lit new fires just weeks after my return to Davis. I was still the only faculty member at UC Davis who taught Middle East courses as a regular part of my teaching load. However, that year, UC Davis hired three new scholars of the Middle East, Amil Shakri, Baki Tizjan, and Jocelyn Sharda. In 2002, I invited them into a reading discussion group, which met monthly at my home. It was Omnia's idea that we turn it into a Middle East South Asia research cluster. And by 2004, we had founded the Middle East South Asia Studies Program at UC Davis, which now boasts robust faculty of Middle East and South Asia scholars. 
feminist Arab American studies had been developed in the United States over the 1980s and 90s. The first effort at creating an organization, an organization had come as early as 1982, led by Carol Haddad, called the Feminist Arab American Network, FAN. FAN did not manage to survive, but feminist Arab American studies continued to grow. The first conference on Arab American women was held in Manhattan, Kansas in 2009, organized by Michael Suleiman, a political scientist who was not a feminist scholar, but who was deeply committed to Arab American studies. Before he passed away, he asked me, Elaine Hagopian, Lisa Zuhair Majaj, to organize a conference on Arab American studies at the Arab American National Museum in Dearborn, Michigan. Nadine Nabar joined the committee, and with the help of the Arab American National Museum, we organized the conference. Out of that highly successful conference, Rita Stefan led the effort with Pauline Vincent Holmesy, who's on this uh, Zoom, Randa Kayali, and me to co found the Arab American Studies Association, which is an affiliation with NASA in 2012. Increasingly, there was, a need to there was a recognition of the need to foster and fund social science research of the Middle East, not only in the United States and Europe, but also in the region itself. In 2010, that recognition led to the founding of the Arab Council for the Social Sciences, a critical member-driven collective community of largely regionally-based scholars to support regional scholars and regional scholarship. In 2011, partly in my capacity as president of the Middle East Studies Association of North America, I worked with a, team, with a team to organize a three-day conference for anthropologists of the Middle East within the Middle East Studies Association annual meeting. Out of the event, Marsha Inhorn and I co-founded in 2012 the Association for Middle East Anthropology, AMIA, uh, within MESA to connect with its sister organization, the Middle East Section of the American Anthropological Association. The Arab Studies Institute had been founded in 1992 with the founding of the Journal of Arab Studies, but in the cauldron, of the year 2010, one of the most generative organizations emerged. Jedaliyi was founded under the umbrella of the Arab Studies Institute in 2010. AS, uh, ASI also founded the Quilting Point, its audiovisual arm in 2002, Fama Research, its research arm in 2008, Jedaliyi in 2010, Tedbin Publishing in 2012, then ASI went on to create major projects like the Knowledge Production Project in 2008, the Status Podcast in 2014, and the MSP Project in 2016. So I look back at this institution building of mine and that of others and wonder why and to what avail. I'm not sure I have an answer. It was not a forethought. It's not, it was not with forethought, nor with planning. I did not set out as a young scholar to become an institution builder. Few people do. I was not a visionary. I did not have a landscape or a map of where I was going or where the field was going. My guess is that many of my good colleagues who were institute, building institutions during these heady and heated decades might say something similar. Perhaps there was a series of historical moments, needs, vacuums, spaces that needed filling. Perhaps more than anything else, it was survival. I was compelled and I believe others might have been as well, by the need for safe spaces to work, the need for community, the need for collaboration and for good colleagues to work with, especially colleagues who knew and cared deeply about the Middle East. I understood that none of this work of producing contextualized knowledge could be done alone. To produce knowledge about the region and for the region that was historically situated, that took account of colonialism, imperialism, capitalism, racism, classism, sexism, Eurocentrism, and the many other forms of knowledge dislocation, there needed to be safe spaces. We needed to institutionalize it, spaces for knowledge production. Anthropology had taught me that institutions give you structures for survival, for living, for enduring. Now, with, ac with the academy, increasingly under attack, academic freedom as well as freedom of speech at high risk, and with science politicized and ridiculed by a frightening percentage of this population of this country, I feel more strongly than ever that we as scholars must create safe spaces for our work 
and the work of our emerging colleagues. For we are once again in a boiling cauldron. And perhaps for the past 50 years of Middle East studies, we have never been out of the cauldron. Perhaps we had a few years of low simmering heat, but not much and not for long. Now the cauldron is flame again, as much as ever, if not more than ever. Islamophobia is virulent and openly practiced in electoral and national politics and, and in some instances instantiated by law or by the power of the state as, as the Muslim ban is an example. To openly be Muslim is to put oneself at risk at times, especially for women and bearded men. Surveys show that there's a rapid increase in hate crimes against Muslims and Muslim looking people in the United States, in England and in Europe since the 2016 national elections, since Brexit, since the Dutch and German elections. Libya, Yemen, Syria, Iraq and Afghanistan are still in violent turmoil, producing the worst quite refugee crisis since World War II. The region seems to be at war with itself. In Lebanon, the banking system has collapsed. The popular protests, which brought about a million people to the streets in October 2019, have been shut down by the state, by the COVID-19 pandemic, and by an explosion that killed 2,700 people and made 300,000 people homeless. Qatar is being boycotted by Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Bahrain, and the UAE. The boycott on Iran appears to have strengthened the control of Iran's Supreme Clerical Council. Turkey continues to imprison more journalists than any other country in the world, while civil society organizations are shut down and academics are imprisoned and silenced in Egypt. What is this roiling cauldron that scholars of the Middle East and the people of the Middle East find themselves in now? What does this moment call from us institutionally politically and in scholarly terms. We find ourselves in a historical moment. Area study scholars must always be students of history and good students of history. We need to map and read our own intellectual genealogies, identify our scholarly and political choices, position ourselves historically. History makes us as much as we make history. We cannot invent history by fake news misleading stories or distorted narratives. To whatever degree we twist history into what it was not, we pay the price in not being able to understand the present or anticipate the future. Where we have been, where are we now, and what are our next steps as academics, as scholars of the Middle East? I no more have answers than any of you. What little vantage point I might have is a member of a bridging generation. When I entered the field of Middle East studies 50 years ago, it was hardly a field where it was rarely read by students, out, by scholars outside of Middle East studies. It was founding itself. It was possible to know all, most of the scholars of Middle East studies, or at least in your own discipline, in anthropology, Emers Peters, Evans Pritchard, Talal Essek, Nicholas Hopkins, Cynthia Nelson, John Gulick, Robert Fernia, Elizabeth Fernia, Clifford Geertz, Louise Sweet, Louise, Lucy Wood Saunders, Richard Antoon, Hamid Ammar, Rosemary Saya, Fuad Khoury. I engaged with them all, and many of them in an extended fashion, except Evans Richard, because in that generation, we only had each other. The succeeding five generations birthed a number of generations of scholars, each emerging from the cauldrons of their historical moments and each adding rich ingredients to the stew that is now Middle East studies. It is certainly no longer possible to know all or, or even to know most of the scholars who work in the field of Middle East studies, even in your own discipline, or even to read the, uh, most of the literature in the field, even in your own discipline. That's an amazing accomplishment and recognition. It is a recognition that leads me to think it is a time for reflection, rethinking, taking the big picture of what we have accomplished in Middle East studies and what yet needs to be done. This may not be a recipe for everyone, but it is an approach I would encourage you, those who are so inclined. It is what I have found myself focusing on recently, the big picture of what we have accomplished. I would urge us as anthropologists, as social scientists, as humanists, 
to work more collaboratively, to take on large projects, to create and join inter interdisciplinary teams. These are not the sort of problems that we face in Middle East studies that any discipline is equipped or any scholar is equipped to address on their own. I would encourage a generation of Middle East scholars to ask themselves, what is the social relevance of the work you are doing? What is the social good that you are contributing to? We need to be inclusive in our projects, make sure that we have delivered something that is useful to the people with whom we work. Work with them as partners. And where work is needed, help them build their research capacities locally. We need to work with civil society organizations, public organizations to disseminate research results locally, giving the work back to the countries so it can, poss so that it can possibly be used to build towards some social good. My comments are obviously from a particular positionality. I cannot know whether they will be of any use to you. To whatever extent they may be useful, I put them out there. But what I do know is that a generation, that each generation of scholars needs to understand itself and its scholarship as part of a historical moment. Each generation needs to, needs to dissect its own moment. Each generation needs to stand in front of that steaming cauldron and identify the ingredients in the stew and decide what are you, what are you going to take from that stew? What are you going to take from that roiling cauldron? And what are you going to add to it? I have a painting at home by contemporary Egyptian feminist artist Huda Lutfi. It shows a string of women jumping over a fire. The quote on the painting says, when you see a fire, jump into it or it will burn you. So I say to you, stand in front of the fire, stand in front of the cauldron of Middle East studies. It is hot and it is roiling. And unless you jump into it fully, thoughtfully, with the knowledge that of your own scholarly genealogy and your reckoning with your historic moment and what you will do to add something of value to that cauldron, unless you jump in with all that you have to give, it will burn you. Throw yourself in. There is so much yet to be done. And so I want to end by thanking again, thank you again for joining me in this journey a somewhat personalized organizational genealogy, this journey into the institutional settings in which we produce knowledge on this region of the world to which we are all so committed and love so much. And once again, I thank George Mason University, the Arab Studies Institute, and my beloved friend, Bassam Haddad, for the opportunity to join with you in this reflection. I look forward to our chat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um... Uh, Professor Joseph uh, Suad, thank you for um, a, uh, a wonderful narrative about uh, the field that is so necessary to be uh, recorded and registered and uh, perhaps studied only if, if only because we, we need to keep doing this. And there are uh, fascinating new scholars, rising scholars, students, activists, artists, that are part of our uh, broader cohort who are uh, probably as we speak uh, hatching new uh, initiatives and organizations and I appreciate your emphasis on the importance of institutions. This is crucial and uh, this is precisely how collective action is maximized. Shukran, thank you so much again uh, for this brilliance as usual and for sharing with us uh, your, your personal journey. And this is, uh, you know this, because I've shared this with you, but also to share with everyone else that uh, there will be, uh, as soon as this uh, pandemic uh, subsides, there will be a, uh, a series of uh, interviews with uh, Professor Joseph that I'll be conducting as part of our next uh, intellectual journey uh, mini documentary. Uh, at this point, um, I would like to open the floor for questions. The uh, uh, everyone here is able to ask questions on uh, one of two uh, uh, platforms, either if you, on 
Zoom if you are already on Zoom by clicking the Q&A icon, which is the rightmost icon on your browser uh, at the bottom. And you also can um, field questions through Facebook. If you are listening on Facebook, which I understand there are quite a few people on Facebook, you can actually register your questions there and we will find a way to uh, bring them to Professor uh, Joseph. If you have uh, already uh, added or registered your questions on Zoom, uh, but in the wrong place, please uh, retype it or copy paste it into the Q&A area. Um, I know that, uh, and, and of course, MK, uh, Mary Kate Smith, I would like to thank Mary Kate Smith, MK, who, for um, uh, engineering this uh, setup and uh, for running the show in the back end. Uh, sure, if, uh, yeah, we're still not getting questions in the q and I'm wondering, MK, if this is simply... So, Sam, I'm gonna go ahead and type, um... I'm going to go ahead and text you some of the questions that I'm receiving, okay? No worries, no worries. Okay, so there is one question um, from uh, Zarqa Parvez. Uh, uh, they ask, the term Middle East studies itself is a form of neocolonialism imposed on the region. By continuing to normalize this term as a reference for geographical location and field of study, aren't we further perpetuating the neocolonial hegemonic knowledge production? And this is um, uh, one of the questions. I will uh, pose another question, Suad, so that you may uh, answer a couple at the same time so we can field as many as possible. This is from uh, Dilshad Muhammad. Thank you so much for a great input. And the question is, uh, I mean, that's what they said. Thank you very much, <laughs> so much <laughs> for a great input. How can Middle East studies and by extension, all area studies as uh, really useful context important disciplines emancipate from their inherently colonial imperial history and still be relevant today, not least analytically? Uh, so what if we start with these two questions because they're a bit uh, uh, loaded and uh, we could field other questions in batches. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you both for these questions. They're questions that uh, all of us in Middle East Studies think about in various ways uh, and uh, lose, sleepless, lose night, uh, sleep at night <clears throat> over these questions. The, it's absolutely true that Middle East Studies, <clears throat> that Middle East is a term that was a colonial invention. It was uh, attributed to a naval, British naval officer in the 1890s uh, as a way of, ca of calling the Middle East differently than the East or the Orient. I'm actually involved in a project that is now going on 20 years, uh, looking at analyzing the New York Times um, uh, from 1850 to the present uh, in terms of the words that are used to refer to that region of the world. And it, it's actually quite charming and funny at moments to see what terms are used. Yes, it is true. The term Middle East comes from a colonial history. So does the term America. So does the term, so, so do most terms. So does the Far East, uh, so does uh, South America. I mean, it, it, the, the, the dilemma I always um, reflect on and uh, think about is how is it, how is it that we can kind of stand outside of our historical time and reflect on our historical time? It's something extremely difficult to do and I would wager cannot be done except in certain historical moments where things seem to open up and we see things a little bit differently than we would ordinarily see. Uh, and th in those moments, maybe we can come up with different kinds of paradigms, different kinds of theoretical formations, different kinds of historical understandings. Uh, the, um, and maybe from those will come a different vocabulary, a different set of categories. And, and I think this will link directly to, to the second question, which is how can we emancipate Middle East studies from its colonial history? Uh, you know, uh, I certainly don't have a single answer to that, but one of the things I have com committed to doing, and I've been doing it for over 20 years, two decades, is helping to train early career scholars in the region to carry out their own research. 
to, to and among in that training, what we do, and I work with a, a team to do that. Uh, the Air Families Working Group started that. We had 16 scholars, some of whom are on this um, uh, screen as we talk. I see Annalise Morris has joined us, and she is one of the Air Family Work uh, Air Families Working Group uh, team. And I mentioned uh, uh, the uh, TURB uh, training to engage. Uh, research group, which includes Zena Zatari, Nadine Nebar, and Lina Miyari. And what we try to do is work with scholars in the region uh, so that they have the skills to get funding to do their own research, but also the skills to carry out rigorous research that will allow them to develop their own theoretical frameworks uh, that, uh, that take account of local histories. I don't know that we ever fully stand outside of our historical moments. I think that possible meaning completely emancipate. Uh, those, those, those are the moments of, uh, of huge cleavages, huge, huge cracks in the armor of, of the social structure that we uh, find ourselves in. There was that moment in the 60s that I was privileged to be a part of where I thought we've, we've cracked some of the armor and some things did certainly change as a result of that. I believe that this moment that we're in now, which uh, desperate as it seems, could possibly be one of those moments. I think the Black Lives Matter movement, the, the environmentalist movement, the things that we've seen on the ground uh, that are uh, collaborative initiatives, intersectional initiatives, coalition building initiatives that are not local. They are not even national, they're global. Uh, could be yet another transformative moment for, for the world. Um, it, it, it's not our privilege, our right to know what the moment is that we're in when we're in it, but it's certainly our obligation to try to understand it. And it is a hope that I have that this is one of those transformational moments that we're in. Thank you, uh, Suhad. I have a few other questions uh, to share with you. Um, the first is uh, from Catherine Hoffman, and it is, uh, of course, all of them start with nice uh, words, and there is a ton of uh, feedback on the talk in the chat, Suad, and they are all glowing uh, with, you know, uh, satisfaction and, and far beyond. So uh, we will save those so you can read them because there are some personal messages from people that you might know. Uh, so uh, Catherine Hoffman shares, of course, thank you for the inspiring talk uh, and the importance of building structures. The question is, would you please talk about the study of ethno-linguistic minorities issues in the history and present of MENA studies? Uh, you know, and then there's a note remembering North Africa, not just Middle East. Uh, this is one question. Another question from uh, Cameron uh, Amin. By the way, Cameron Amin, I was watching uh, recently as, as uh, I was fielding the questions. You have a spaceship um, sort of room that you're in, and I'm very impressed. So I, I will have to contact you to see what, what that thing is. Yeah, it's very nice. I have no idea. It looks like something from Star Wars, 1980s, though. Um, it's beautiful. Um, so he asks, uh, what do you make of organizations like ASMIA? And that is a very straightforward question. And then uh, the third question uh, by Natalie El Eid, and I will stop after the third question. I am wondering how to pursue the important work of institution building during a time of social isolation. How can we perhaps use a moment like this for collaboration rather than isolation? Thank you to all, and th thanks to Saad. Thank you. Wonderful questions. Um, I'm not a linguist, as you know, but my good friend uh, uh, Fatma Siddiqui, who is on the screen with us, uh, on the Zoom with us, is a linguist. And one of the things that she commits her uh, scholarly work to is ethno-linguistic minorities in North Africa. Um, so I think that is a very important uh, um, undertaking. And there are scholars who are doing just that kind of work um, in the um, uh, I'm currently uh, co-editing a handbook of Middle East women uh, with my uh, former student and good colleague Zaina Zatari, and we tried to find scholars to do precisely to do uh, articles on ethnic uh, ethno-linguistic minorities in the Middle East for that handbook. Um, 
Cameron, I mean, uh, what do we do with organizations like SMIA? We let them be. What, what, I mean, they are who they are. We know who they are. And uh, they will continue to produce the knowledge that they produce. Uh, uh, they, uh, they were formed, as you know, as a critique of, of MESA. Uh, so uh, we uh, respect their right to produce whatever knowledge they want to produce. Um, and Natalie, Aid, during a time of social isolation, how do you build organizations? Well, this is one of the times when I'll say thank God for Zoom and all the bazillion platforms of social media. I'm sure all of you are Zooming. I don't know what your life has been like, but my work has actually escalated during this period of sheltering as a result of Zoom, because now I just have one appointment after another uh, on Zoom and I end up seeing people and talking to people I might not have because I would have waited till I traveled to Cairo or to London or to Beirut uh, to see them or New York or some other place. Uh, so you've got, you've got social platforms. Um, I think social platforms are actually a very exciting way to create um, uh, collaborative and coalitionary uh, political, social, intellectual uh, organizations. And I would really encourage you. Uh, I think what I've learned and one of the reasons I was uh, interested in uh, presenting and sh this talk of sharing what is uh, in some ways, a, a personalized genealogy is that uh, is that I didn't know any of this when I started. When I was a graduate student at Columbia, I didn't know how to form organizations. I didn't know that it was important to form organizations. It was the failure of our panel and the suggestion of uh, of the uh, AAA. Why don't you form your own, own organizations? And I asked, well, <laughs> that was not a hard thing to do. Not only was it not, not a hard thing to do, but it still exists. What is it? That was 76 we formed that. How many years? Somebody count with me, 40 plus years that it now exists. So it's not as hard as it seems. The important thing is you have to have a purpose. Why is it you wanna organize? Who is it you wanna organize with? And who is it you wanna organize for? Those are the more important things. I think uh, or what makes an organization endure and all of these organizations that I have discussed uh, except for one or two, have endured, is that it, they have a purpose, they fill a need, they draw in a constituency that feels the urgency with you to for that space and to address that need. And if you can, if you have those going for you, you will find people who will work with you. Uh, the key for me, again, to form an organization is that they be as democratic as possible, as transparent as possible, as decentralized as possible, uh, my first experience was is how difficult hierarchy is. You have to have some, you have to have some leadership, but uh, make it as as transparent as possible and as, as open and as collaborative as possible. If that helps. Thank you, um, Saad, and those who asked the questions. I will be asking questions in batches, but I do want to share that uh, given the... Uh, stream of questions, if you can try to send your questions in the next uh, few minutes, because it looks like if we keep going, there will, there will come a time when we have to give uh, uh, Professor Joseph a, a break. We have a question from Facebook, um, and it's by Adriana Kubaya. Thank you so much for this enlightening institutional and personal history. In light of all of the troublesome challenges our region faces today, could you reflect a bit on how we see you see the future of fieldwork as a method of knowledge making and for developing the kind of situated theoretical frames that we need? Uh, this is the first. And uh, the uh, second is from Ahmed Ismail. Thanks a lot for the inspirational talk. I have a question. I really think that institutions are essential for pulling minds, but how can we redefine what institutions are, are in order to escape from the hegemony of the current ways of knowledge production? Is there, uh, if there is nothing radical to be done, how can you reform instead of conforming with the current definitions and practices of institutions? And finally, uh, the third question, I actually will ask for, is that okay, uh, Suad? I'm, I'm taking notes. I'm doing the best I can to take notes. Okay. Go ahead. All right. 
So the third is by Hanan Sabah, I think, Sabah, S-A-B-E-A. Given the particulars of the moment and the spaces in which we are producing knowledge, isn't an emphasis in institutionalization rendering the very process of knowledge production and its actors more vulnerable to all sorts of techniques of surveillance and violence? A very Foucaultian question. And then finally, uh, a question by Isra Al-Muftah. Would love to hear a word of advice on institutionalizing networks in the repressive contexts that ban formal registration of institutions. I'll stop here. Could you repeat that last one? Um, sure. I, I, um, would, would love to hear, that's Isra saying, would love to hear a word of advice on institutionalizing networks in the repressive contexts that ban formal registration of institutions. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, Adriana, I think, uh, the future of fieldwork um, as a method of knowledge making, knowledge production, this is a real serious and difficult question. Um, I am uh, co-editing, just finishing a book with Zena Zathari and Lina Miyari that came out of a TURB, the Training to Engage uh, Research Group. Uh, and it is all contributions by early career scholars doing fieldwork in their own countries. And to a person, they all uh, address the concerns of surveillance, censorship, and uh, uh, difficulties of access. One of the contributors actually was kept uh, pleading that she couldn't even write because she had so much difficulty getting permission to do research. It is a reality. Uh, there are a few works, uh, if you'll email me, I can um, send you a reference later, uh, uh, talking about the difficulties of doing research under the uh, field work under these uh, um, increasingly repressive conditions in these countries. Uh, I think we have to, I, I, I think the, the, I don't know that there's an answer that I can give, but certainly caution, care, working with, uh, in partnership with local universities, working in partnership with local scholars. Uh, uh, I, I think this is not a time to work alone. It's not a time to go under the radar. It's not a time to think you can go through the back channels. I think it's a time to work with colleagues and with organizations uh, so that you are protected, the knowledge you produce is protected, and that you can, uh, and that you have communities around you who know where you are and what you're doing, uh, and can be there for you should should a situation escalate. Um, the book that I referred to uh, that I'm working on with Zena Zatari and Lina Miyari is going to be submitted literally in a week or two to the press. Uh, so, but, so that'll be about a year or so coming out. Um, uh, Ahmed, institutions are essential, uh, but how do we define institutions so that they don't get co-opted or end up conforming to uh, hegemonic um, paradigms? There isn't one answer. I certainly don't have one answer, and I don't think it's something you do and then you're done and then you're free. I think it's something we're constantly subordinated and subjected to hegemonic paradigms. I think it's a constant struggle. I think it's, it's one that requires constant uh, questioning of oneself and the kinds of uh, research one is doing. And that's why, again, I think we need to do collaborative research. We need to work with others so that others can help us raise those questions and we can bounce ideas back and forth. Uh, this is not a time for isolation. This is a time for uh, where the collective, the communal, uh, the collaborative uh, is, is so desperately needed. So I think that uh, we are always, always at risk of co-optation. And often we have, we are, we uh, do get co-opted and don't even know it. So we just keep on working at it. There, it isn't, it isn't a, a one-off solution that protects us from hegemony. That is the very nature of hegemony. And that's the very nature of why resistance and Refusal and rejection has to be and is an ongoing struggle. But again, I, I would plead here that that one of the best ways to work against the hegemony is collaboratively and uh, collectively. Hanan, my dear friend, 
is the emphasis on institution building, setting people up for surveillance environments, uh, of course, of course, and how could it not? But are we more free? Are we more protected? Can we produce better if we do so alone? If we do so un, uh, 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 without outside the, the, the parameters of uh, organizations like Arab Studies Institute, like JWU, like Middle East uh, Studies Association. The Middle East Studies Association has had a huge impact. Its presence made possible uh, the visibility for so many of us. Uh, and I, I think all the very, the Association for Middle East Women's Studies, the fact that there's a journal for Middle East Women's Studies now, it, ma it makes things possible. It makes certain kinds of knowledge possible that even if one had produced it but could not circulate it, uh, of, uh, of what use is the most beautiful poem in the world if no one hears it? You know, it's like, the, what, what, what is that marvelous uh, poem I had it memorized in high school uh, uh, about Rodora? Uh, if the sages knew why, thy beauty is wasted on earth and sky. Tell them, dear, that if eyes were made for seeing, then beauty its own reason for being. Well, maybe knowledge is its own reason for being, but isn't it more powerful when we share it? Isn't it more wonderful? Isn't it more enduring? Doesn't it have more ad impact when you work together? And I just believe that when you work together within institutions, then the possibility of enduring is more, uh, uh, more uh, it, it escalates, which does not at all mean that, you, that it, it does not also subject you to more surveillance. As we have seen the way in which uh, Arab American institutions are under surveillance and even charity organizations are under surveillance all the time. So that's the dilemma, the reality that we work under. Ezra, again, my friend, uh, it, uh, building institutional networks in repressive conditions that ban formal registration of institutions. Uh, you know, we lo live in a global world. You, you don't have to register or, or organize in one location. In, in one country, you've got, we, we are a global knowledge producing uh, uh, community. So you can work with people outside of the country that is banning that, uh, that formal registration. You can, and again, that's why social media has become so powerful. You can work with colleagues in other countries. It's one of the reasons I founded UCDAR, the, Univers the University of California da Davis Air Region Consortium. And as I said, several of you on the screen are members of that, or your universities are members of that. It makes things possible that might not be possible in your home country. So I would encourage you to think about international collaborations, global collaborations, uh, getting your organizations off the ground in other places that do allow registration uh, and or work with organizations that are already uh, uh, established that with which you have some affinity or um, shared goals and, and vision. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. And uh, Saad, uh, I'm assuming that uh, we can do one more uh, set uh, of questions. Sure. And after that, it's up to you. You could tell us to go home, um, or you could field another if you if you like. I think you're all already home. Uh, yani, uh, yani, yeah, uh, away from the setting where we're all at. Uh, by the way, I just discovered that uh, the set behind uh, the person I was uh, saying, you know, has a great set, uh, like a real set. It's just an image, but it looks so oh. real for Cameron. I mean, looks like he's in a spaceship. So just so that people don't get as jealous as I did and then yeah. feel no recourse. Okay, so uh, the question from Maya Magdashi, our colleague at Jadalia and ASI, um, co-editor of Jadalia. So she asks, thank you so much for this amazing life's history uh, and history of institution building. You are an inspiration to me and so many. I was fascinated to hear about the 1984 San Francisco meeting, as well as the parallel intersection and intersect and intersecting history of women's liberation movements slash intellectuals of this period um, in Euro America. This is there might be a typo. Max, Marxism, feminist, radical feminist, intersectionality, etc. And the question related to this point is: What do you see? 
uh, the legacy of this particular trajectory in feminist history within Middle East studies and vice versa. We are reading Audrey Lord and Adrian Rich in my class this week. And I can't believe I hadn't put these institutional building histories together. Thank you. That's Maya's question. Another question is by uh, Zainab uh, Lamy. Uh, thank you very much for the fantastic talk. How can our body of work aiming at understanding the region be significant to its people when it is done in foreign languages and institutions or institutes? As, as far as I have observed, the general knowledge of the history and politics of the region is Eurocentric. Therefore, how can we divorce the public knowledge from these Eurocentric narratives when our body of work is inaccessible to them? Um, there are other statements and comments that are not questions per se, uh, and I will leave those until the end. If we have time, I'll probably just share them in a rapid fire mode. Um, do you want me to take those two? Do you want to stop at these two and then we do another batch? Sure. Uh, How about this? How about if I ask people to uh, take the next couple of minutes to write down the questions and then we'll, we will cap things uh, like literally at uh, uh, 2.28 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This way, the questions that come before then are the last questions we will pose. Thank you so much, uh, Saad, for your generous uh, energy and, and willingness to, to move beyond the hour and a half mark. Yeah, I, I'm fired up. So you can see my cheeks are flaming here. So that's <laughs> into, that's into fired up. <laughs> that's <laughs> <good> for it. <laughs> this is, uh, uh, I, I'm just uh, thrilled that you all are hanging in there. And, and it's, a, it's an honor for me that you want to continue this conversation. So I, I'm, I'm here with you uh, if you'd like. So Maya, Maya, my dear friend, uh, intersectionality. Uh, you're absolutely right about the question of intersectionality and the, the you know, our fields, there was a moment, uh, I think this is why for me, it's so interesting to, to reflect. There was a moment in the 60s and the 70s where one could actually read across all of these fields. And so intersectionality was, was lived because we were, we were in each other's lives. Uh, when I came, as I said, when I came to Davis, there was there were no other Middle East scholars teaching Middle East studies. Uh, Elias Tuma was in economics, but economics is not area or oriented, and they wouldn't let him teach Middle East courses except once every four or five years. And uh, Louis Gravetti was in nutrition and geography, but he did ancient Egypt, and geography wouldn't let him teach that course that often. So I was the only one who regularly taught Middle East studies. So who do you talk to? There were so I talked to feminist scholars. I talked to. Uh, progressive scholars in history. I talked to scholars in uh, uh, literature. So th that was a moment when you could do that. Now, and I knew every talk on women's studies that came to campus. It was possible to go to every single talk that came to campus on women's studies. Totally impossible. In fact, I don't even know the talks that are coming to campus on women's studies today. So it's, 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 you've got more work to do. The intersectionality uh, is a, a far more difficult uh, process now simply because there's so much and that's a good thing that's a good thing uh, so what I would say what, what I would think is, again I, I really really think we need to think big we need to think of large projects large questions which we could not possibly answer alone which force us require us demand of us to be in conversation with each other across the lines of discipline and across the lines of paradigmatic categories uh, I find myself working a lot with engineers right now. I have a project that um, uh, Hanan is a part of. Uh, there you are, Hanan, in Cairo, uh, staying up until the middle of the night, I'm sure, for this. Uh, by the way, Hanan stays up all night long when we do our, our workshops. She stays up until from, from uh, 11 at night until 3 in the morning, so we do our workshops. And the workshop that we're doing, the project, is gendering STEM education. So we're sitting, here we are, Hanan and I, two anthropologists, but we're working with engineers and biologists and mathematicians and uh, who else, Hanan? Uh, uh, um, uh, electrical engineers and mechanical engineers and, oh my gosh, they're all STEM scholars, except- Geologists. Geologists, thank you. Geologists, I forgot Dawn. Geologists. 
And uh, here, Hanan and I, the, and, and of course, uh, Livia Wick is a part of it, and she's an anthropologist also, and Martina Riker. But what we're trying to do is work across the disciplines, uh, across the STEM disciplines. We're not just talking about working again across humanities and social sciences, but working with STEM scholars. And what are we doing? We're raising the, the foundational questions of what are the assumptions built into your concepts? Hey, you STEM scholars that tell us that you know the world, that you're all objective, that everything you do is based in reality. Is there something not so, uh, not, not so factual about what you're doing? Is there something problematic about what you're doing? Do you have biases built into your projects? And what we're finding, and it took a lot of work, we were sitting literally uh, like, a, like a classroom, a seminar, meeting with each other week by week by week, and we would do homework for each other. I would give them questions, they'd come back with essays answering those questions in which we would interrogate foundational concepts of science, of STEM, and what did we find? We found that they had, they had gender biases, they had race biases, they had class biases built into foundational concepts of science, of STEM, that STEM scholars don't even talk, uh, talk about. Uh, I'll just give you one little example that, that Hanan and I dearly love, uh, uh, was that uh, it turns out that uh, in chemical reactions, there is the, the primary neutron or whatever that, yeah, that pushes the action, and then the, the, the one that is reacting uh, as a result of the initiative of the first uh, um, neutron or atom or whatever. Well, do you know the term that is used for the one that is, rea that is the reactive one? It's called the slave. Now, tell me that's not a racialized term. When we discovered this, I didn't know that this is a term that is standard in the STEM fields to call the, the, the one that is acted upon a slave. When, when we raised, when, when it came out in our meetings, the STEM scholars were themselves stunned to think that this term that they used regularly is a racialized term. And so what we've done, what we've been doing, we've been working now for three years to uh, think through what are the foundational concepts among this group of, of STEM scholars and social uh, social scientists, uh, I would I would urge you to think those kinds of things. You know, challenge the boundary. We, we already are challenging the boundaries of the disciplines. Disciplines fell away a long time ago, but far beyond that, look at the foundational assumptions of each of our disciplines and our neighboring disciplines and our not so neighboring disciplines, and work across. And the way what makes you what forces you, what requires you, what, what demandates you to work across is to take up the large questions. I, I think we, we're in a moment of history where we are called upon to raise the large questions. And I know that's a, a very difficult thing, especially for early career scholars. So I'm not, uh, and, and because early career scholars have to get publications and you've got to get your tenure and so forth. So I would say work with senior scholars for whom it is not such a risk to raise the large questions. And that's partly what I see myself doing with a lot of these projects that we've been uh, leading is that we, we provide an umbrella. So bring junior scholars along. It's not as much of a risk for them to be raising the large questions, but that's what we need. If this is, if what I said a few minutes ago makes any sense at all, if this is a historical moment that has transformative possibilities, we cannot afford to be wasting time on small questions. We just don't have time to raise small questions. We must be raising the large questions about the structure of society, about the structure of labor, about the structure of the market, about the structure of inequality. You name it, the environment, the earth. Will we have this earth in another half century? Will there be a moment a half century from now where somebody can do what I'm doing now, reflecting on a half a century of research? What will the earth look like? raise the large questions and raising those questions will, will put you in the, in the laps and the arms of your good colleagues uh, uh, in other disciplines, other fields, other countries, uh, uh, other um, paradigms. So Maya, you're raising absolutely the important question now. And I think you and your generation and the people working with you, because I know your projects are poised to do just that. Uh, Zainab, um, the body of work for the body of work to be significant, but uh, but it's not in Arabic or Persian or Turkish, and it's being done in Europe and the United States and other places. You're absolutely right, and that's why I have, for the past 20 years, the past two decades, devoted so much time to training early career scholars in the region. We carry out these. I probably have 
over the past, I was trying to count <laughs> recently, I don't know if one can count, but it, we've, we've trained at least a thousand young early career scholars uh, in proposal writing, research design. Uh, uh, and again, as I say, some of you on this Zoom today and on Facebook today were among the people who worked together to do this uh, so that they could do their own research. And I, and I would hear uh, tip my hat, especially to the Arab Council for the Social Sciences, which was founded in 2010 and is in Beirut. They're doing marvelous work and they do work in Arabic. They do work in English. They do work in French. Just go on their website, Arab Council for the Social Sciences. Fantastic work they're doing. There are scholars all over the region. And I would uh, want to cite especially, I think, uh, Bir Zaid University, the Women's Studies program there. Amazing work that they're doing, fostering and training uh, early career scholars to work in Arabic in their own countries. So I, I think this, this you're, you're absolutely right, Zainab, this needs to be done. And I think it is being done. Uh, and we, does it, do we need to do much more? Absolutely, we need much more to do much more. And I would um, uh, urge you to join us. <laughs> Bassam, that you. Trying not to um, cut anybody off. Okay. So thank you very much for all of your questions and to Saad for being so generous in fielding them and responding to everything uh, very uh, meticulously. Uh, we have a list of or a few comments and, and statements, so I'm not going to share them uh, with everyone there in the chat. People can take a look at them. It's 235. I would like to close by asking you, Saad, a very simple question that you probably and we probably cannot uh, adequately answer, but hearing your thoughts on it would be quite interesting, even if in a, a sort of um, concise form. Uh, and it's the it's a counterfactual to what many have asked regarding the difficulty of producing knowledge in the region about the region. Uh, in a world where, uh, let's say, in the Arab countries that, that many of us study, um, if there has if there is a development where political systems are far more open where you could actually write about social and political science anthropology in a, in a politically sensitive manner in uh, everywhere in the region or in most places in the region if that is the case as opposed to today when it's so often difficult which is why a lot of people write from from outside and so on uh, how do you think this will affect knowledge production on the Middle East, generally speaking? I think we would, it's a huge question. <laughs> and you're right, I can't answer it, but uh, <laughs> that's never stopped me before, so I will anyway. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think it's one of those questions that um, reminds me of an image I always uh, uh, put for myself. We're always, producing knowledge, looking at a horizon. And we want to know what's on the other side of that horizon. And in a society where we don't have regulation, in a society where we are free to produce, in a society where uh, knowledge is not suppressed or censored uh, and so forth as you're uh, proposing, that horizon will almost be, is already infinite, but will become even more so, meaning that uh, it, we cannot even begin to imagine today what questions could be possible. If we were not always constrained, always uh, bound by the categories that we live within. Uh, I've recently done some work, uh, an article that is in, in press right now, called categorical thinking. Categor categorical thinking is the way the mind works. The mind sees something and it puts it into a category. It's the way language works. You can't even utter a word without using a category. So categorical thinking is just the way we are as human beings, just the way we use language, just the way the mind works. But the world is not given in categories. We impose our categories on the world. And the world imposes, and here I mean the social world, imposes categories back on us. And so it is our constant struggle to first recognize that we are living inside of, of uh, bounded categories, to, recognize, to understand what those categories are, and to try to break out of them in a way that is productive and meaningful. It's 
I love the poem of Gibran Khalid Gibran on children. And it's one that I remind myself being a parent and a mother and now a grandmother over and over again. We cannot live in the house of our children. Our children will build houses that we will not know how to inhabit. And that's what your question poses, Bassam, and it's a beautiful question, is that if those constraints were not there, the way our minds are currently constructed, we would have to re-inhabit our minds. Our minds can yet not yet inhabit that world. And, and except insofar as we are willing to live in what I call a constant state of doubt, a constant state of uncertainty. What do I mean by that? I think it's the essence of good science that you never accept your own findings as definitive, that you're always willing to question what you think and how you got to that thinking, that to be a science in a scientist in the good sense of science, you have to embrace doubt and uncertainty, be willing to, be, to overthrow your ideas and have others also overthrow your ideas and have that be a good thing. And so that future, unregulated by censorship and current hegemonies, is a, is a future where I think doubt and uncertainty will thrive. And it may be that the pathway to that future will be the embracement of doubt and uncertainty, by which I mean always willing, always willing to let go, always willing to be, to be found wrong, always willing to be overthrown, and always willing to find that to be a good thing. If that makes sense, my dear friend, Bassem. I mean, Absolutely, and and I know it's it's not it's it's not like a uh, uh, you know a uh, run of the mill question, but it's one way to think about uh, alternatives and to sort of get at some of the questions that so many of us have. And of course, I I, I uh, refrained from from barging in because there are so many wonderful questions, but those questions about. Uh, people writing about the region from outside the region and 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 what that what that means, especially within a, a you know a, a colonial a sort of context and from a perspective of imperial hegemony and so on and so forth. Um, so I uh, and, and sometimes I want to say that uh, sure, I mean these are really important questions, and I uh, support uh, a very meticulous and uh, uh, deliberate ways of dealing with those questions. But I also want to look at the other side and uh, note that if you are following knowledge production in the region, about the region, in Arabic, or in whatever language it is about the region, it is also important to recognize that this knowledge is not free from problematics. In fact, uh, one can, can find in, in a, 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 uh, an equal proportion of, of problematics. Uh, the, and I just wanted us to sort of leave on a positive note about the potential future where where people in the region can write freely. Um, shukran, uh, Suad. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for 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 your you know beyond the brilliance and sophistication and intellectual, uh, intellectually and analytically uh, superb uh, approach and content. I, I want to thank you for your grace, for working so hard for so long for so many years and decades and still be so positive and open and collaborative and graceful in the way you approach matters and you, the way you empower so many people and organizations around you. Shukran Iktir, thank you so much, uh, Suad. And thank, thank you for you. being here for, for this duration. Thank you all for joining us uh, today. And uh, either you see me looking everywhere because I have screens everywhere, which is why I was jealous of Cameron's uh, picture, which turned out to be a picture. But we have people on Facebook and uh, Zoom. Thank you all. And thanks to Mary Kate, MK, sorry, MK, for uh, being an awesome interlocutor and organizer. And uh, the uh, struggle continues uh, with people like everyone here and with uh, the stewardship of uh, uh, Suad and others in the field who uh, are there to, to, uh, to provide support uh, for new initiatives. Uh, we will actually uh, be uh, doing more of these because uh, COVID seems to be with us for quite some time, including the 
a monthly knowledge production or report on you know the monthly knowledge production at ASI, which happens during the first week of every month. Uh, it's called Live with ASI, which has been uh, extremely popular uh, because it's a, it's a 45 to an hour show uh, live every month that uh, chronicles various forms of knowledge production at the Arab Studies Institute, including live interviews and reports on uh, events just like this one. So please uh, check that out. Uh, you will see it in various places. And thank you, Sahad, again, and hope to see you soon. Is there anything you would like to say before uh, we close? I just want to say that, Sam, you are my idea of this transformational figure. You have, you have carried another generation by creating so many opportunities, so many sites, so many uh, 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 safe spaces, secure places for especially early career scholars to work together, to work collaboratively, to think big, and to find outlets. Uh, what you're doing with the ASI, with Jedaligi, with Tadween, with all your projects, is transformational. So my friend, hats off to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, thank you, Azizdi. This is, uh, I'm, I'm just like in the forefront, there are uh, dozens and hundreds by now since 1992 who are like carrying all this weight. And and uh, that's why I'm hopeful and, and, and we could Absolutely. actually do quite a bit if we continue with this collaborative uh, uh, mode, especially along the lines that you suggested. So uh, it was an inspiration actually to watch you as we were building and it's still an inspiration. Shukran Thank you to everyone. Ooh, salam. Shukran.